All right, folks, thanks so much for joining us today for this RCR Wireless News webinar on getting small cell networks right. I'm Kelly Hill, editor with RCR Wireless News and the author of our most recent special report on this topic, which posted today on our website, rcrwirelessnews.com. Uh, let me give you a quick introduction to our panelists today. We have Emil Ulbrich, who is Vice President for Network Technologies at Signals Research Group. Dennis McCall, PMTS Maintenance Engineering at Verizon Wireless. And we also have Dan McVaugh, COO of Centerline Solutions. Uh, so we'll be running through presentations uh, from all of those folks first, and then we'll be diving into Q&A. Uh, please feel free to submit questions. Uh, the slide deck will also be available to our participants after the, uh, after the webinar. Uh, <clears throat> just a quick news update, some of the uh, small cell developments that have been in the news recently. We had Verizon signing a national small cell infrastructure agreement uh, in January with street furniture company J.C. Dekaw. Um, we also had Ericsson and KDN utilizing CRAN small cell architecture in street furniture in the Netherlands. Um, small cells in San Francisco uh, boosting capacity during the Super Bowl and uh, if I remember correctly that also involved street furniture and uh, Extinet, uh, Verizon Wireless particularly uh, talked about some of the things that they did there and I think we'll hear more from that, uh, more on that from email in a bit. Um, we also saw enterprise small cells with a boost in 2015 according to numbers from mobile experts and uh, the overall market there for small cells uh, projected, one projection from uh, Radiant Insights expecting to, uh, to reach six billion by 2019. Um, so those are just uh, some of the things that have been in the news lately on that small cell topic. It's definitely getting a lot of attention right now as, uh, as carriers put more focus on this area. So looking into our Getting Small Cell Networks Right special report, again, available for free download on rcrwireless.com. Uh, some of the key takeaways from that report uh, include talking about how ecosystem partnerships, uh, master use agreements, services, tools, uh, you know, all of these things are contributing to better efficiency and streamlining when it comes to small cell deployment. Um, and that's contributing to the momentum that we saw in 2016 and continuing forward from 2016 onward. Um, when we think about tools when it comes to small cells, uh, some of the folks that I talked to, you know, talked about things like analytics, geolocation information, um, simpler walk testing and fiber testing equipment, you know, backpack setups, etc. Um, information rich databases, uh, just one example in the form of uh, Nokia networks, uh, headnet engine room, small cell services from vendors, all of these things are helping the ecosystem tackle those small cell deployment challenges around backhaul power and site acquisition. Um, they're not completely tackled, but uh, we're getting there, I think is generally what I've been hearing from folks across the ecosystem. Uh, also in general, that we're seeing more and more distributed network architectures, whether that's small cells, you know, sort of as we've come to identify them you know, as more or less mini base stations, whether it's DAS, uh, ODAS, or indoor DAS, uh, and CRAN, all of those are expected to continue growing uh, as operators densify their networks. Um, and interestingly, uh, Internet of Things and 5G are also influencing small cell deployments and strategy with an eye toward uh, using higher spectrum bands, um, you know, thinking about the latency and capacity requirements for 5G, you know, and also uh, different Internet of Things strategies. So uh, carriers have both of those things in mind as they're thinking about current small cell strategies now, um, you know, with an eye toward what those are going to mean for their networks going forward. And with that, I'm going to pass this over to Emil, and uh, he's going to walk us through his presentation. All right, Kelly, thank you, and I'd like to thank you and RCR Wireless for this opportunity uh, to present on uh, uh, some information uh, on uh, small cells. So uh, without further ado, um, when, when we started looking at this, um, I took a look back in the past. Um, at uh, a survey that was done, um, actually a survey of analysts, and you can go to the next slide, uh, Kelly. Uh, for the, uh, and just looking three years back, um, you look at the hype, there was uh, a lot of hype, and I kind of draw that akin to the uh, HD DVD and uh, uh, Blu-ray uh, fight and New Coke, but uh, when you look at it, uh, people were uh, very excited about small cells, and including myself, we, we wrote a lot of articles about HetNet, how it was going to uh, solve this explosion in uh, mobile uh, uh, network uh, utilization. 
And I guess in the U.S., we just didn't see that happen. We saw um, a, a lot of uh, carriers uh, purport to say they were going to put in, you know, 30, 40,000 small cells by the end of 2015. And um, you see them retract that and you kind of wonder well, what happened. When we looked at other markets, uh, you look at Korea, they're almost uh, in Seoul and outlying areas all the way down to Busan and other uh, uh areas and provinces uh, is almost 100% small cells, but their small cells are 20 watts. They have lots of capacity, lots of down tilt. They cover small geographic areas, just like a small cell, but uh, they're consuming all of that data. And what we, when we started to look at the uh, radio access network vendors, we saw that uh, a lot of the larger RAN vendors, the, the big three uh, now, uh, were really developing other features uh, that carriers are wanting them to focus on, primarily carrier aggregation and uh, getting different bands approved through 3GPP and pushing that through. However, as we watch the standards industry, and as we watch 3GPP, the carriers and with their um, vendors uh, in tow are really pushing for small cell enhancements. So we still see it um, as a priority. Uh, next slide. So I need to talk a little bit about our Broncos. Being here in the uh, Denver uh, Boulder area, uh, some of you may not know, but they are world champions. Uh, but looking at uh, the Super Bowl and specifically Levi Stadium and the other venues uh, for the surrounding week for all the media and uh, all, all the uh, events that happened uh, prior to the Super Bowl, the four uh, national network carriers, Sprint, T-Mobile, Verizon, and AT&T, spent, uh, Kelly may know this, they spent over $200 million um, to add capacity to Levi Stadium and, and surrounding areas. But when you start to dig into it, um, you look at what was done. AT&T, they upgraded their DAS systems in all 26 venues. Um, they added new cell sites, macro cell sites, and cows, but no small cells. Same thing uh, for Sprint. They nearly doubled their capacity in Levi Stadium, but it was all done with DAS upgrades. T-Mobile, same thing. They had a capacity of 150 sites surrounding the area, brought in cows uh, around the stadium. Verizon was the only one that really put in specific small cells and street furniture. And that showed they had the most data usage. Now, granted, they may have had more customers there, but um, they had uh, seven terabytes of uh, uh, data flow through their network during the Super Bowl. Um, they also put in, you know, 15 macro cells in addition to those small cells. Interestingly, you know, uh, Comcast, which uses Wi-Fi access points, similar to a small cell type architecture with regards to uh, the size of the uh, coverage uh, area, had over 10 terabytes of data. So they beat all the uh, uh, wireless carriers. Now, that was free as long as you had Xfinity access, but uh, they did that uh, and showed that that architecture uh, can be utilized uh, specifically uh, in a large scale venue. Next slide, Kelly, please. So what's the problem? Why isn't there more te testing? Why isn't there more deployment? When we started to talk to the marketplace, um, looking at uh, what's available, uh, initially multi-vendor support. Um, most of the enterprise small cells that we see getting deployed are, at least for outdoor small cells, are the same vendor between the macro site and the uh, small cell. So X2 interoperability, uh, and uh, being able to uh, exchange uh, interference coordination and really, truly get SON working um, has been an issue. Uh, SON uh, vendors have made a lot of promises and in talking to the uh, network carriers, they just don't believe that uh, inter-vendor SON is working in LTE the way it has worked in UMTS and 3G. So uh, that that is still yet to be proven, I think in a wide scale basis, uh, at least uh, to the carriers that we talk to. Carrier aggregation has been a big uh, part of it too, uh, getting uh, multi-carrier small cells. Um, they're, they're getting more and more prevalent, but um, initially uh, they were single band LTE. Now as uh, more and more bands are becoming available, you look at, you know, at t alone has, um, you know, four different band combinations and more getting on. And you have other carriers like Sprint with TDD and FDD uh, integration, which is a problem. And I think Kelly touched on this earlier, uh, the analysis of where coverage is needed is changing. 
uh, a lot of crowdsourcing is being done. It kind of started with speed test, and now you have others like Group Metric and Open Signal, and they're even making big commercials about it and how many balls roll down and how much kind of coverage I have. So that is really starting to change the perception of where coverage is needed, how it's needed, and how to supplement that. And so we have webinars like this, and we concentrate on this, and I, I, I thoroughly enjoy this. But when you look at it, we're really talking about the enterprise market. And if you look at small cells that have been shipped, it's less than 5% of all small cells that are shipped. Yeah, this is kind of what this webinar is about, is that 5%. Um, the other 95% really uh, comprise the enterprise, uh, or the, the sm sorry, not the enterprise, but the small home office or residential market. And the reason there's not a lot of testing is that that's sold directly to the consumer. Uh, so they have a known issue with coverage uh, in their house or their basement or wherever they're doing business. So there's likely not interference due to uh, isolation, uh, RF isolation from the building structure. They're lower on power and they can de be deployed by the customer. They're paying for the backhaul, uh, typically, you know, cable modem, and there's no optimization being done. Interestingly enough, you see programs now for the enterprise starting to take advantage of this. Uh, um, uh, carriers are now offering in-home small business packages for enterprise businesses where you can put it in an enterprise grade small cell that has three nodes on it and uh, have coverage in your network. So we see that happening uh, quite a bit um, uh, in the enterprise market starting to take uh, cues from the uh, small home office market where it's a self deploy kit and uh, no optimization or testing is necessary. Next slide, please. So, However, I, we don't think the small cell is dead. In fact, it may be ready to explode. And part of that is uh, we see a lot of utilization of uh, unlicensed spectrum, a lot of movement in that place uh, by non-traditional carriers and by large carriers. So uh, in that space, you have LT unlicensed um, or uh, licensed assisted access, LAA, the, the 3GPP version. And um, with that, it's tied to a licensed cell. So if you are running uh, LT unlicensed in the five gigahertz band, um, you have to have a licensed anchor cell because that's downlink only, the uplink goes to the licensed cell. So that coordination between the LTEU base station and the licensed base station, there has to be a lot of optimization, um, deployment uh, strategies as far as uh, timing and uh, handover to the nodes and all of that has to be taken into account. Um, you add into that um, all the advances being made in Wi-Fi with um, 900 megahertz, 2.4, 5 gig, and 60 gig bands being made available. There are a, a lot of different bands. They um, uh, propagate differently through building materials, and so the way they get deployed and the way they get integrated, especially with LTE Wi-Fi integration, um, that will be important uh, to optimize uh, those different touch points because uh, as we know, uh, people are making more and more of their uh, data usage indoors, you know, probably three quarters of all data sessions are indoors. So being able to optimize these very small cells, especially at the 60 gigahertz, gigahertz range and integrate them in with the uh, anchor uh, license base station is uh, truly important. Um, and with that, I am done. Okay. Excellent. So we are going to move on to Dennis McCall. Uh, thank you so much for that email. Um, folks, if you have questions, please uh, get those in and we will get to those once we're done with our presentations. And uh, so we are going to move on to Dennis McCall of Verizon Wireless. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Kelly. I'm, I'm very happy to be here and, and very happy to participate um, in this conversation. I think it's a very important one. I think you're, you're bringing together a lot of folks with different viewpoints and uh, we'll be able to discuss uh, some of the gaps and some of the limitations at least, and I will be, be able to provide um, at least a, the carrier um, a viewpoint. It's some of the questions that, that Emil brought up, they have great answers and I'm looking forward to discussing them. Um, go ahead and just highlight the entire slide since I'm not, not in controlling, but, but everybody knows that um, we're, you know, we're basically accelerating or we're, we're proceeding to, to see uh, an exponential growth in, in data. And more, there's more requirements uh, more devices, more types of, of devices, and we're we're really bracing to, we have to embrace the fact that that's happening and look for capacity solutions. The uh, competition is, is fierce. 
uh, revenue growth is not keeping pace, so we have to look for ways to to reduce our our cost. We have to keep an eye on that, and we have to make sure that we're we're looking forward, not just this year. We need to be looking forward many years, so that as we're building these massive networks with with hundreds of thousands of nodes, that we can we can pay for them. We can make sure that we're keeping an eye on our lease costs, uh, our operations and maintenance costs, and our operations and maintenance requirements. Of course, we're not going to stop building but we absolutely need to be able to keep control or, or maintain uh, our quality that, that everybody has is, is come to expect from Verizon Wireless. But, but that can't slow us down from embracing new technologies and new opportunities. And we have seen um, the legacy of, of Verizon is one of reliability, five nines reliability. And so that to some degree has caused us to pause when when entertaining less reliable systems, like uh, voice over Wi-Fi or your eFemptos where the backhaul uh, requirement or the backhaul quality control is maybe not in our purview. That's from coming from uh, 20 years in, in a, a very quality oriented um, company. It's a tough pill to swallow, but it's one that we absolutely have to embrace and that we are embracing going forward. Um, yeah, go ahead and go to the next slide. And going to light it up. So we are, you know, we see the need to to increase capacity, and and spectrum is certainly a part of that. We know we have LTEU coming. We have voice over Wi-Fi, which which you know Wi-Fi should be considered an alternative. I think our customers have multiple ways to to get. Uh, get their data or get their service. It used to be that they were dependent on the carriers alone, and then when they left, uh, when they left uh, the their homes, they really didn't have that option. But we're seeing Wi-Fi is proliferated, and it and there's certainly an alternative. And Wi-Fi hotspots being integrated into handsets and having friends with alternate service vendors, even in large venue situations, people will find a way. And one great thing about that is they get less upset. I mean, the customers are certainly. Well, we're very sensitive to to their to their needs and what they want. But if you have multiple sources uh, or multiple ways to get back or get your data or get your service, you, you tend to, to be happier. And that's what we're talking about: developing all of these solutions, your narrowband LTE solutions, um, all of the CRAN solutions, machine-to-machine -machine solutions. And we're, we're embracing that. And we're moving forward, and we're making sure our customers are happy, but also maintain we're maintaining reliability. Um, the need for, for Spectrum is coming, right? Well, it's here, but we're, there's a lot of new features that are coming out, or new new systems, new protocols, LTEU, and the discussion about 5G is very exciting. You know, we're going to higher and higher frequency bands that we wouldn't even have considered a few years ago. So it's very exciting, but we're also, we're holding on to a lot of Spectrum as well. And the use on our, our EVDO services and uh, and CDMA services, they're both waning, right? They're they're, they're going to be going down EVD a lot faster than CVD, uh, CDMA, but we're going to have spectrum that we can refarm, and we're going to be doing that aggressively. We already are. But the trend as we're building this, these heterogeneous networks or these enhanced toolkits, I like to call them, they're still going to include macro cells. Um, but we're also having to embrace new systems, your spider clouds, your eFemptos, your voice over Wi-Fi. And as we, we fill out this toolkit, we'll continue to deploy the right solution at the right location. Um, go ahead and uh, go to the next slide, Kelly. Thank you, and light it up. So small cell deployments, you know, I think three, you know, a few years ago, there was a, you know, there was an, uh, an expect, expectation set that we we're going to deploy these things by, you know, every day, hundreds, all the time, everywhere. But, but the actual operational limitations associated with these deployments and the costs for backhaul and the costs for leasing, they were were no different than your macro cells. You know, I mean, the the people that were leasing this property expected macro cell money, and the backhaul associated with that is macro cell money for the backhaul. So if you're, you're going to build a very small footprint service and you're gonna to have to pay macro cell money, the tendency was to try and get macro cell performance out of it. But now over the years, we have been able to develop these alternative agreements with, uh, you know, we're thinking out of the box. We're trying to find um, ways that we can deploy um, that are going to reduce these costs going forward since our revenue isn't growing as fast as it was. We have to do that. 
and we can't just aggressively start deploying without a, uh, without um, knowing how, where we're going to be five years from now. And that really was the cost. I think there was sticker shock associated with the cost of deploying a small cell, but now that we've figured it out and we're developing, we're figured out these ways to deploy them intelligently and reliably at lower costs, you're seeing them happen. You saw it at the Super Bowl. And looking at the Super Bowl is really, a, look at, it, it's a crystal ball as to what we're going to see in the very near future. You can bank on it. Data is going to go up and you're going to see more small cells. And it's, I wouldn't call it an explosion, but a, an exponential growth that is started out very slow, but it's going to pick up speed, a lot of speed. And you'll see that same speed pick up with alternative solutions such as eFamto and spider clouds and, and whoever's going to be next um, in, that, in that toolkit development. So but we're, we're focusing, when you look at where small cells are being deployed, they're in dense urban locations, very dense urban locations. You look at some of these maps, and you look at these dots on the, on the maps, and they are where the people are. You're not going to put a small cell in the middle of nowhere. It's just, that's not the purpose of it. Getting these devices very close to the customers is where, how you're going to get higher SINAR, and that's exactly where you're going to get your capacity. Continually, and when you compare the addition of, of spectrum and the improvement of SINAR, Sign, improved SINAR is going to deliver much more capacity than, than enhanced, uh, enhancing spectrum or deploying more spectrum. So, but we have to get these devices right next to the customer. You look at a 60 gig uh, device of some kind, you're talking about a service area of maybe 150 feet. That's without obstruction. So you're gonna have to get smart about that and figure out how that's going to look. And you have to remember, you know, the folks that are, have been doing RF in this, in this space, and five gigs high, you look at the antenna sizes and the dimensions and the performance characteristics of these 5G, these, these 5G um, discussions, and it's, it's gonna be different, but we're gonna have to embrace that. When it comes to small cell testing, we have to make sure that as we're deploying all of these systems, we have the quality controls in place. And we have to make sure that we have the ability to monitor the performance of these small cells, deploy them, and, and control them. That means, and then it's one, that's one aspect of, of small cells that is often overlooked, the fact that people have to be able to, to monitor them. And if you buy somebody else's small cell, you're, you're gonna have to invest in their operations and maintenance tools. And, and if you do that, that means that the people that, that work on these systems have to have that training and have to have that experience. And it's probably gonna take a few years for them to ramp up. So you can't just go out and buy somebody else's gear. Not if you want a reliable system. You have to make sure that the people that are on the ground know how that stuff works and they have experience with it. And you have to have it figured out long before you deploy. That's why it's taken us a while. But we also have to keep our eye on the, on the RF ball. Um, we're, we have a, a strong focus on making sure that we're developing um, our, our, our people, our technicians and so that they have the RF fundamental background so that they can embrace these problems and solve them simply. Instead of throwing money at a problem, they need to be able to know when to engage and when to pass. And that's a, that's a strong, that's a, where we need to spend a lot of effort, emphasis. I think, uh, I think that's about it for me. Okay, great. Um, well then, Dan, we're gonna move on to you. Great, thanks Kelly, and thanks again for the opportunity to, uh, to speak today. Um, so uh, at Centerline, we're, a, we're a, a full turnkey services company that we design, build, modify, and maintain wireless networks. So today I'm going to uh, speak from our perspective of kind of the rubber meets the road on what we've seen the last two years. And I'm, my focus is more on outdoor small cell, um, indoor small cell we've been, we've been deploying for, you know, five, six, seven years. But um, the last couple years, I think, and, and a lot of the focus of what Dennis and Emil have been talking about is, is really focused on outdoors. So, um, and what I'm going to talk about is, as we've been doing, whether it's RF, SIDAC, um, A&E, construction, maintenance, um, the three main factors that we're seeing that really um, impact the successful deployment are, of course, the size of the equipment, but not just the equipment, but the size of the overall site, all, all ancillary equipment as well, um, as well as, obviously, time to deployment, um, and then, of course, the dollars. Um, what, what are the actual direct uh, CapEx and OpEx impacts that, that we've seen um, in actual deployments? Um, you know, from a small cell standpoint, you know, PCIA defines the size of a, of a small cell very specifically. They say it's less than 17 cubic feet 
um, in, in, in equipment size and less than three cubic feet in, in the antenna enclosure. And, you know, they, they've got, there's some very specific definitions that people are trying to wrap around small cell. But, you know, our, our perspective on it is that really at, at the end of the day, it's figuring out a way to do things faster with less equipment, smaller equipment for, for less money. And uh, so I don't know that the definition falls into such a clean box, but it's just more a matter of if you can, if you can do it quickly with less equipment, simpler equipment for less money, then I think that it fits into that category. So, um, from a from a capex standpoint, you know we're talking about you know it needs to be in the target of you know a fraction of the cost, 10% of the cost, um, you know half the amount of time. So, um, go ahead, Kelly. You can go to the next slide. That's fine. So, um, you know we've seen a number of great deployments where small cell deployments are going quite well, and we've seen others that they've gone not so well. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they've gone badly. It's just what we're seeing is, um, as you see on the, the left, you know, an example of what we've seen as a small cell that's been done right and it's been very successful. But then what we've seen, uh, we, we kind of coined a term or, or some of our, with our, some of our clients called SMACRO, which is sort of the, the merging of a small cell and a macro where you got a, a little bit of the flavor and a little bit of the advantages of, of small cell, but you still have some legacy requirements that are still there that, that are requiring, you know, more equipment on the ground and, you know, sub-metering for power and, and things of that nature. And, and what we see is that um, from a deployment standpoint, um, it's, the, you know, it's everyone's expectation that small cell is small cell is small cell. Let's get it done quickly. Let's get it done inexpensively. But the, the reality is, is as we tend to, to morph into this macro perspective, uh, and, you know, you add a sub-meter and you add more equipment on the ground, you know, like, like Emil and Dennis said, you ha now have landlords that expect to be paid a full lease rate. Um, or it takes you a lot longer to get the deployment done, or you're now subject to traditional uh, leasing and zoning perspectives. So, um, you know, I think the key is that when we've seen it done right, we've seen it done by doing things like keeping the equipment small so you can maybe keep it off the ground. Um, working with, um, you know, utilities and right-of-ways and, and other master uh, agreement uh, um, holders where you can you can knock out clusters of site instead of ind individual sites in, in, one sw in one fell swoop. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the key on the timing is, is still going back to the things we all have known for a long time, which is availability of power and availability of backhaul. And so like uh, both Dennis and Emil talked about, um, when you look at those, those things as available resources as part of your planning and part of your implementation, uh, you find that we find that uh, our customers are more successful and we're able to meet those requirements. So um, it really comes down to, you know, we're building a heterogeneous network. Let's let's have a process that's very holistic and heterogeneous that sort of looks at all of these factors together, and not doing things the the way we may be, may have done them historically over the last 20, 30 years with macros. Let's not, you know, have an RF engineer design the site, throw it over the wall to a site acquisition specialist, and they come back with three candidates. But instead, let's sit down together, and maybe have a a specialist that can do both RF and site ac, and look at the overall. Um, um, network and 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 have uh, smart locations and flexibility in locations and like Dennis talked about um, you know understanding that hey some of these nodes may not be ideal in terms of the quality but they're still going to have a very positive impact on the heterogeneous network um, so that's kind of been our our perspective what we've seen so far and we expect to see as as any deployments new deployments and technologies we expect to see it continue to to be more towards the left side of the screen um, so. Next slide. From from a cost standpoint, um, these are are not by any means proprietary to anybody, but they're just sort of ballparks of what we've seen on our end of uh, successful small cells versus traditional macro cells on on what the dollar impacts have been to deployments. Um, you know, successful small cell projects over the last couple of years, we've seen come in at you know the ballpark of tens of thousands of dollars, twenty thousands uh, on the capex side. And recurring um, opex, when you take into account all your opex hits, your lease, your power, your maintenance, um, you know, hitting you know eight thousand a year, you know, compare that to what we're all used to on the macro cell side. That's significantly better, and um, I think it will continue to be refined. And so we're seeing some success. Um, we are seeing the the macros where you you kind of are getting you know a traditional lease rate, even though you have the lower equipment cost, for example. So some some meshing of those two uh, ballparks of cost, but uh, that kind of gives you a view of, of what we've seen on our end in terms of um, the impact to the, to the cost structure with small cells. So that's it.
Okay, great. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, folks, we're going to start getting into your questions and uh, and a few others. Um, I, I'm seeing quite a few uh, questions about whether small cell backhaul is being done uh, through fiber predominantly or microwave. Um, I, I thought it was really interesting. I heard a variety of um, of perspectives on that, but I know that, for instance, uh, not to put <laughs> not to put words in in Dave's mouth or anything, but uh, you know, during the last call, Verizon, uh, the last quarterly call, um, we had uh, Verizon uh, executives talking about how. Uh, fiber was was basically all of their small cells, um, you know, as opposed to maybe, uh, you know, 90 plus percent of macro sites, you know, with some, uh, you know, with some um, uh, microwave, but it sounded like, uh, you know, at least from Verizon's perspective, you know, predominantly fiber backhaul. Um, you know, on the other hand, I did have some folks talk about the potential for Sprint, um, you know, the densification that they're looking to do, uh, you know, potentially, utilizing some of their spectrum holdings for wireless backhaul. Um, I don't know if any of our participants have, you know, perspective on what they're seeing in terms of, uh, you know, fiber versus uh, versus microwave or, or other wireless backhaul. Should we just jump in? Yeah, sure. <laughs> One answer. Okay. So this is Dennis from uh, from Verizon. So, but that statement about being all fiber is, is accurate. But we also know that our, you're going back to our, our revenue and, and having to, to reduce cost, uh, not only our, our capex, but operational expenses as well going forward, and and it's just it's a natural. This is a part of a natural evolution where, where we have to look at our reliability requirement, look at our back, battery backhaul requirement, um, and determine um, if that makes sense because our customers want service at the end of the day. And if we say, well, you know, it's not going to be reliable, and and somebody else is going to provide uh, adequate service, then our customers are going to go, and we can't let that happen. Mm -hmm. But we also need to do the best that, best that we can, but, and we also have to reduce costs. So it's, it's kind of a natural evolution to, to embrace different backhaul solutions, not just my, micro, uh, microwave, but, but the other you know, point to point solutions that are available. And we're seeing the, being developed by not only our vendors, uh, but also um, other folks that are out there. It takes time to develop them, but absolutely we're looking at that. And it's, it's, and it's through these solutions that we're going to be able to, to provide the best service and most reliable service going forward. Okay. Anybody else? Emil or, uh, or Dan? Sure. Um, I would just, yeah. this is Emil here. Um, I would just say uh, that in all the carriers that we talk to, fiber is their first uh, choice, lease line, um, microwave, and then in extreme cases, millimeter wave, but that, you know, it's almost fiber hundred percent of the time if they can get a fire and um, you know, uh, Dan and others can, can talk to this two or three years ago, it was hard to get a fiber locate on a utility pole. It's becoming much easier now. Now they know how to get street addresses. They know how to uh, 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 get uh, fiber or uh, cable access there. So that issue that you saw maybe three or four years ago is becoming less of an issue. Now it's still there, but, um, definitely the first choice by all the carriers we talk to is fiber. Okay. Uh, Dan, yeah, any thoughts? Yeah, definitely. This is Dan. I agree. You know, we're seeing predominantly all fiber deployment so far. And I think part of that is that's, that's kind of the low hanging fruit as well. You know, on the deployments, you know, when you look at where there's available resources and focus there first. Um, so I think as we mature in the deployment, we're going to start seeing the need for, for other backhaul solutions. And, and, you know, I was reminded by one of my engineers the other day that we still have some elements in the 3GPP uh, 4G standard that enable things like in-band backhaul within the within the LTE channel that haven't really been developed or, or leveraged yet. So, you know, we're going to continue to see some things that maybe we don't even realize that are going to help, you know, enable that backhaul. Um, obviously, that taps into your capacity when you do that, but could very well help you with a quick deployment. So. Um, I agree. We, we haven't seen any, hardly any microwave at all yet um, uh, within uh, small, true small cell deployments. Okay. Um, we had another. Uh, okay. And Kelly, just one, one, one clarification. We're talking about enterprise small cells, not the small home office uh, ones that okay. most okay. that those are cable modems and you know DSL type connection, broadband connections, wired yeah. connections. 
this is enterprise just yeah. to differentiate that yeah absolutely absolutely um enterprise or carrier uh, i think is, is primarily what we're what we're focusing on so um we, we did have a question about uh something that dennis mentioned uh the need for better uh signar and uh and the the question was uh, addressing the need for better signar and cqi to get higher data rates um dennis since you touched on that can you talk a little bit about that because I heard uh, from from a number of people in the small cell space, you know, talking about how, you know, when you get these things in, um, you know, that they are really seeing quite good capacity gains. Um, and, uh, and you touched on that uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, getting these things close to customers and, and how that changes the sort of the RF game. Okay. So when we think about the sign R, it's going to be signal to noise ratio plus interference. And, and when, when, we require, when we want to push more data, we're gonna go with higher modulation code schemes that have, have uh, less and less room for error in that, in that transmission. So we have a, a list of, of modulation code schemes that we can use, but, but we can't use, but we're dependent on signars to pick the right one, to have the right amount of, of blur so that we don't have to constantly send retransmissions and achieve not as much as we want. But there's two components. There's thermal noise, but also the, the and propagation also comes into it, but really cell to cell or, or intercell interference is going to drive um, uh, our sign R numbers. Because if you put two cells right next to each other on the same channel, mm -hmm. then right in the middle of them, you're gonna have uh, a zero dB of, of sign R and it's, it's just not gonna be good. You really need much better sign R. So if you can isolate your cells, either through down tilt or, or proper placement, then you can achieve higher sign R, which means you can deliver more data. And if you're delivering more data or faster data, then you, the number of people you can service is going to grow. But as soon as you reach the point where you, the, you let's say if you're providing a, a certain number of people data, if you add another person and that amount of data that you're able to supply goes down because you don't have the, the, the gross throughput, then everybody starts queuing up at that point. And mm -hmm. as they start queuing up, the throughput goes down further. And so if you hit your capacity limit, you're, you're just done. Mm -hmm. You absolutely have to maintain the largest uh, pipe that you can get, and it's gonna happen by getting the best sign R you can get. Okay. Um, Dan, any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I, I think the other, the other thing, and actually you know, Dennis pointed, pointed it out um, earlier in his presentation, is proximity between the subscriber device and the cell itself have huge impacts on that signar. Um, it keeps everybody at lower power because they're not having to transmit through as, through as much distance and or um, um, clutter in the environment. And so in, in, inherently with small cell deployments, you're going to get the overall system-wide signar and, and noise floor to be more in line. But that's only if you do it well in a way that is coordinated with your macro network and you, you don't ignore your macro network, you have to, you have to constantly make sure that you're optimizing the macro network to take advantage of that um, that densification so that you don't have uh, an overlay underlay scenario where you're not improving that sign our situation okay great um, we had another question uh, are the major operators monitoring and maintaining small cell sites in-house or outsourcing to third parties to save opex costs um, I can speak to that uh, to some extent, it, just in terms of what I heard from folks across uh, that I was talking to in the course of reporting here. Um, you know, we had uh, folks like PCTEL, uh, you know, on their last quarterly call talking about how they generally expect sort of neutral host model, uh, you know, much like DAS has been in the past. Um, at least even if uh, each individual site might not be neutral host yet, although that is a goal of the, the small cell forum to, to work toward, uh, you know, that we are gonna see uh, the extinets of the world, the, uh, uh, the crown castles of the world, uh, putting more and more uh, energy into, um, you know, putting those sites up. And in fact, uh, I think Crown Castle in its most recent quarter said that they had spent more money putting in small cells than they did on macro sites. Um, email is that, uh, do any of our participants want to, uh, to speak to that in-house versus outsourcing? Oh, I, and I know that um, in the case of, in San Francisco, uh, you know, some of those, uh, you know, were Verizon wireless owned and operated and, uh, you know, it was a split uh, and some of them were, were extinet. Um, so, you know, I think we're seeing, um, you know, that, uh, that carriers are not necessarily looking to 
to uh, to reown a whole lot of towers uh, now that they've mostly jettisoned uh, tower assets. Uh, but uh, it seems like from what I'm hearing that we're going to see a mix of you know some in-house uh, and some outsourcing as far as uh, as small cells go. But uh, participants, any uh, any thoughts on that? So, when it comes to the the signal source or your your e node bees are going to be the signal source, and whether you're you're providing the small cell um, footprint or our antenna system, or you're you're relying on on your crown castles or your extinet, they're going to provide the the the, the conduit um, through which we're going to deliver signal. But at, after that signal reaches the customer and the customer starts processing that that call or connection, um, those those metrics are being kept track at uh, kept track of at the e node B. So we're getting receive levels, we're getting a return, you know, return loss information, which isn't always uh, useful. Um, we're getting noise information about the ambient noise that's present, and, and we're monitoring that. I mean, that's part of our, our, our operations and maintenance platforms that we hold so dearly. Um, and, and in all cases, your, your crowns and extranets are going to want to see that information because they're going to control the, the gain levels and path balance issues um, associated with those systems are going to are going to be reported by the enode B, and they, they often want to know what, what the enode B is seeing, but when it comes to the, the traffic that's going through it, they, they don't have any visibility to that. But it's often good to partner with them so that they understand what's going on and where they can engage to improve uh, overall performance. Okay, great. Um, uh, another question uh, for you folks. Um, I'm wondering if we can talk about real world deployments. Uh, I, I know we have uh, some folks on here who uh, have seen these things in the real world. Uh, obviously, Dennis, Dan, um, you know, can you talk, can either one of you, you know, talk about uh, real world small cell deployments, you know, what the deployment was, goal was in terms of coverage or capacity and, and sort of sketch it out for us how, uh, you know, how those things have played out? Uh, Dan, maybe we can start with you. Sure, you bet. Um, so we've seen uh, the the bulk of the the outdoor small cell deployments have been in uh, tier one markets like Chicago. Um, uh, we're you know we're seeing them start hitting to some of the tier two markets like uh, Seattle and Denver. And uh, what we're seeing is definitely um, the customer looking for um, densification, and so there'll there'll be a a set of candidate hotspots that need to be addressed, but we're not necessarily um, being asked to address every each and every one of those hotspots, but instead to go through a process to to sort of optimize the the uh, deployment process to say, okay, which hotspots can we address, and which ones can we address on our time and budget constraints, so that we can get it done within this project schedule. Um, and so, it, it, at this stage right now, it's been more of a um, you know, like I said, a low-hanging fruit. There's a lot of opportunities for improvement, so let's focus on the ones we can get done quickly and within our budget, and um, and make sure that they're they're within those those hot spots. And then we're cross-referencing those hot spots spots where um, where our clients have master use agreements, where they have right-of-way or utility agreements in place. Um, and so that's really been the focus. And then of course where they've also got. Um, access to um, to fiber assets through their, their backhaul partners. So um, so really that's the focus is where, where are the assets, where is the backhaul, where is the need, and look for the the, um, the convergence of all of those things in a way that can be done on time and, and on budget. So I, I don't know if that answers the question, but but that's really the, been the crux of all the deployments so far. Yeah, Dan, that that characterized that very well. And when it comes to the to the need, there's three elements that we look to to determine how valuable an asset is going to be, or how valuable a cell site is going to be. And it, it's going to depend on uh, the, the the signal conditions that are there, because if if there's a lot of uh, macro cell there that that is uh, going to interfere and reduce your sign R, then there's the capacity element is going to be challenged. Um, we also need backhaul, and we also need people. So if we if we have a backhaul in a particular location, um, we need to keep that in mind, but we also need to make sure that we're looking for the number of people that are present and the sonar conditions that we can create. And basically that'll tell us how much how much time that we're, we're going to capture with that cell site or how much capacity. But then all everything that Dan said is right on the money. Okay. And, and you know, actually, I'll, I'll actually add to that real quick that um, where we're seeing a less than, than ideal success is, is due to a few things. One being, um, 
you know, we may have hundreds and hundreds of applications going into a utility that has an, an approval process or even a jurisdiction where, you know, a jurisdiction has built a process to handle, you know, tens of applications a month of macrocytes, and now they're getting hundreds, if not thousands of applications in that same time period. Um, and it's a first in, first out kind of process still. And so what we're starting to see is um, utilities, we're starting to see jurisdictions almost go back to some of the same things that we saw in the mid 90s with the large um, PCS build outs, um, which was jurisdictions and utilities starting to come back and say, hold on a second, guys, we may need to put a moratorium here until we figure out how to how to process all of this. We're being overwhelmed. Um, and so there's some risks right now in terms of the aggressiveness by which deployments are trying to be pushed out where, um, you know, there, it, it's going to take some, some, you know, tapping into our experiences of this happening in the past to really do a good job of not letting it get into a moratorium situation. Okay. Uh, we've had a couple of questions in terms of power uh, and small cells, um, you know, as uh, you know, sort of the, uh, the the vision for these things has been, you know, uh, you mounted on a light pole, as we saw in, in some of the pictures here, um, you know, uh, mounted, you know, maybe on the side of a building. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that I commonly heard was, uh, you know, was master use agreements, uh, you know, with municipalities, with, um, you know, with utilities kind of helping out with uh, scalability in terms of, you know, having access to, to power and, and a whole lot of sites. Um, so the, the question that we had from our audience was how much runtime was required for small cell backup power? Um, Dan, I don't know if you, or if you or Dennis can speak to that in terms of, you know, helping folks understand, uh, you know, how that compares to maybe a traditional macro site, um, you know, and, uh, and, and what, uh, what folks are looking for there when it comes to, to power requirements. Right. And that, that has been a, a large question. And in, in many cases, um, if we go in trying to expect we're going to get macro cell backup power of, uh, on the order of eight hours, we're going to shoot ourselves in, in the foot. Mm -hmm. But so each, each region, each location around the country is going to have to look at the problem they're trying to solve and what real, realistically they should be deploying. In some cases, we're gonna deploy without backup power because we're limited on space. And if we just want that perfect location, and uh, then we're gonna to have to make some sacrifices. Now, we always have our, our macro system behind us. That's extremely reliable, and we don't have to give that up. So even in the worst case scenario, um, where we're going to have service and we're going to work through it. And having that gives us the ability to, to make the judgment call in the cases where we have to give up uh, a backup power. I think, um, and it depends on where you are. If you're in Southern California, the odds of you uh, seeing an extended um, outage are low. But if you're, if you're where weather happens, then you can see extended issues. Um, but we're always going to try and provide the most reliable service. But we going forward, we have to embrace the, the situations where backup power is is um, a, a challenge or it's going to limit us. So I think that we, we talk about eight hours for macro or, or four hours or less for um, for small cells. And it's something that, that the individual uh, designer and region have to decide for themselves. Okay. Yeah, I, I, and I would, I would add that, you know, a typical like strand mounted small cell, it's drawing a, you know, on the order of two watts of power, maybe a, you know, a pole mounted uh, small cell five watts versus 30 or 40 watts of power for a macro cell remote radio head. So, you know, at, if we if we avoid the, the tendency for smacros again and, and really truly do a small cell, now the same amount of backup power you have available, whether that's a battery or whatever it is, can now last a lot longer. It's, you know, pretty straightforward. Um, and I think the other thing that we found with building Im implementations is when we can tie into the building power versus having to bring in a new power with a new meter, oftentimes we're able to convince the landlord to let us tap into their life safety systems in that building, which then provide additional backup power, whether that be a generator or whatever they have. Okay. Um, Emil, I wanted to come back to you. One of the points that you made was really talking about how uh, the use of unlicensed spectrum, uh, you know, could really uh, mean jumpstarting for small cells uh, as as we know them. Um, can you talk a little bit more about, you know, how you expect to see that sort of licensed spectrum, unlicensed spectrum coexistence, and you know, and, and what that's going to mean for network architectures? Uh, sure. So. If you, if you look at what the LTE U forum and uh, LAA, the 3GPP version uh, of that, um, they're utilizing 
uh, LTE in the um, uh, ISM bands and in the five gigahertz bands that Wi-Fi occupies its unlicensed spectrum. So they're free to use it. Um, and, and so carriers are looking for a way, and I think uh, uh, Dennis may have talked to this, to you know, uh, keep their customers, reduce churn, and um, increase revenue. And, and so, and, and it really gives the uh, end user the best experience. So utilizing that, um, you're able to get, you know, fantastic download speeds because you have this, you know, a large 20 megahertz carrier that you can utilize. But that's downlink only. It has to be tied to that, that LTEU small cell, and it is a small cell. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, operating at five gigahertz. So it's limited um, to the uh, uh, power spectral density um, uh, of essentially a cell phone. So um, it, it, uh, it, it can only uh, go so far with regards to the power it has, but that has to be matched up to a uh, carrier grade small cell. And that carrier grade small cell um, uh, provides the uplink and they're coordinated and tied together. There is an interface between that LTU base station and the um, uh, small cell. So that coordination between a five gigahertz uh, uh, band, uh, small cell and a licensed band. So, and that could be any of them. It could be in the AWS band, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 700 megahertz, 850 PCS. All of those ha have to be coordinated. So th there's a, a, a huge amount of work that will come uh, with regards to optimizing these systems, especially, you know, particularly for outdoor uh, situations where it really becomes uh, prevalent. Um, you'll see a lot more optimization work need to be done and coordination uh, with regards to that. But um, this unlicensed frequency, um, Wi-Fi is by far the most prevalent use um, uh, globally. And so uh, this is just another way to utilize that spectrum for carriers to take advantage of that uh, going forward. So there's a big advantage. And then you have this multi-fire alliance, which is like LTN license. It operates in the same band, but it does uplink and downlink. But you don't need an anchor base station or an anchor base station. It is a standalone LTE base station. You do, you don't need a carrier to operate that. So you may see new entrants come in, um, uh, enterprise owners, building owners, deploy their own LTE base stations uh, to provide service. I think that's the goal of that. That's probably a little ways off. And obviously the device ecosystem has to get out there, but you're already seeing trials uh, being put forth by you know, uh, Verizon and AT&T uh, wanting to do this. Um, and then um, uh, looking at how to utilize the spectrum uh, to the best of the ability. And I think that just leads into uh, 5G deployments is we get a better understanding of how things work at five gigahertz and at 60 gigahertz uh, that will, uh, that understanding of how to deploy in those bands uh, on a large scale will feed into the 5G conversations that are just around the corner. Okay. Great. Well, I'm going to take this opportunity um, to thank our panelists. We're going to have one last question. Uh, I'd like each of you to walk us through uh, quickly what uh, what trends do you think we'll see in, in small cells uh, this coming year and going forward? Um, Emil, since you uh, since you sort of started down that path, I'm going to start with you uh, and tell us uh, what you expect. Um, I expect to see the deployment of uh, small cells in the unlicensed band uh, proliferate uh, throughout the uh, U.S. and a lot more carriers uh, start to embrace it and utilize uh, both 5 and 60 gigahertz bands um, with uh, licensed bands. Okay. Um, Dennis? Like with regard to small cells, uh, we're certainly going to see the number of small cells uh, uh, being deployed increase and it's going to continue to increase uh, as uh, we go forward for the, the visible future um, but we're, we're going to have to deploy where it's smart and embrace new technologies for backhaul uh, and I think master agreements are going to be critical to that effort wherever we can form an agreement with somebody that has a location or backhaul or uh, then that's what we have to do and that's what we will do and making it easier for, for folks to do that and develop those agreements will be critical. Okay. And Dan, your thoughts on small cells moving forward. Yeah, I think uh, in the here near term, I think the trend that we're already starting to see is a couple, two things. Uh, the first being that the convergence of the enterprise and, and the mobile network operator, um, we're getting more requests from enterprise to say, hey, we want to take control of our, our, our need for um, wireless data and, uh, and accessibility, and so I think you're starting to see, you know, the network operators in the enterprise space um, 
kind of work together more where um, the enterprise can drive some of the capital spend that like Emil talked about. And then I think secondly, the skill set of those that can deploy these uh, networks, I think you're going to see that skill set be demand to be more technical in nature. So take our construction teams, from, for, for example, our successful construction team members that are deploying small cell are more technical in nature and less, you know, shovel operators in nature. And so I think you're going to see that trend for across the board for the, uh, the, the staff that are performing the work to be uh, a little more adaptable and a little more technology focused. Okay, great. Well, thanks all of you for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our panelists and all of our audience members. Um, the slide uh, deck for this presentation will be available after the webinar, and uh, the webinar itself will be RC will be archived on rcrwireless.com. Uh, don't forget to download that special report, which is available for free. Thanks again for joining us uh, here at RCR Wireless News. <laughs>